What does that say about you? Yeah, well, I think we can go back and refer to... said about me the, the no, better. No, 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 let me do the interviewing <laughs> for a change. Welcome to the show. So glad that you've joined us. Now, you mentioned before the fact that you're not that much into democracy, and now you're telling us that you define uh, boards by their fearless leaders. How so? Is this like the Fuhrer principle? Good question by a lawyer here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you didn't really have to go that way, Pete. <laughs> I know I've usurped your position, but there are some there are some levels that even I will not stoop. <laughs> you want me now to say Romaic ruminations? What the hell is that? Let's change the name. Well, we can't do that because the intro wasn't proper. There was no welcome <laughs> to Romaic ruminations, and I could say, well, um, by the way. By the way, why Romaic? Yeah, why, why this? Why that? Because you didn't do the proper intro. No, I didn't. And therefore, I didn't have any material prepared. So By the way, I think you should change the name of the show. All right. To what? Greek Orthodox Community of Melbourne Victoria Elections. <laughs> it will probably track a lot better than Romaic Ruminations. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, uh, you've opened up a great segue because first off the bat is I do want to talk about the GOMCV. GOCMV. GOCM, Greek G-O-C-M-V. Orthodox G-O-C-M-V. Community of Melbourne and yeah. Victoria. Why, have I, why do I always get those two? Which is generally before? referred to as GOM, Greek. Gongva. No, no, oh, Gong-va. no, 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 not, no not even that. GCM. GC, yeah, Greek community, Greek community, of, community of because Melbourne, we get yeah. rid of the Orthodox and we get rid of the Victoria because yeah. there are no Greeks who live outside of Melbourne. That no. has been statistically proven. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know there are uh, elections on. In fact, it's happening at the time of recording this weekend. This is true. There are elections, <laughs> and the um, and and of course one of the questions that I always ask, and we've always asked this type of question mm. for any organisation is its purpose uh, and its relevance uh, today here in Melbourne and throughout uh, Australia. Now, you've, uh, you've, been around, you've been around the trappings for a while, right? So you clearly must have a, 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 a pretty well-thought-out opinion as to the role of the organisation uh, its uh, and, uh, in, uh, and its relevancy today. I'm interested in that. Why? We've got elections. <laughs> You should be interested in who we're going to vote for, not whether the organisation is relevant. Who cares if the organisation is relevant? Man, we have elections. Well, there's no point in caring about the elections unless the organisation is relevant, right? Oh, Pete. Oh, Pete. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> Pete, the elections are everything. Everything. When you are elected, mm. then you can bask in the knowledge that you are appointed by the people. Right. It's brilliant. I've never been elected to do anything. <laughs> Not even of your organisation? No, no, we don't believe in democracy in elections. Well, it's a, we got rid of that. It's a very it's a very Greek thing. It's even in, in, in a very ancient Greek thing, isn't it? What, not believing in elections? I thought we invented elections. I yeah, thought we only invented in, democracy. Only in, only in five or six city-states that that basically had. Samos was one, right? Are you trying to say that we're all fascists at, at, in origin? I'm not saying that at all. What are you saying? I'm just saying that... Uh, in the most part, you've not been a very democratic race. Don't tell people this. <laughs> <laughs> Just, they wouldn't understand, Pete. Back to the uh, Greek community of Melbourne. Yeah. Um, do you believe that it's... Uh, do you believe at any point in time it lost its relevancy, gained it again, always, or has it always been relevant, or is it still irrelevant? It's very hard for people outside of the the sphere of the politicking that, that goes on here in Melbourne to really ascertain uh, that organisation's relevance. But it is the most uh, public organisation, the one that people tend to uh, recognise the most. Wouldn't you agree? So, sorry, which one was the question? The question was Whether we recognise it or whether it's relevant and whether it lost its relevance. Okay, so firstly, would you say that it is the most well-known Greek organisation in Australia? I don't know. No? I don't know because we live, our communities are so far from each other mm-hmm. and there's little interaction. Mm-hmm. 
I can't answer that question. All right. Um, the next question is, well, are any of the other communities in Australia relevant? Mm. No, is the, com- is the simple answer. Only Melbourne is relevant, <laughs> insofar as Hellenism is concerned. <laughs> oh, we don't need to deal with everything else because that has nothing to do with us. Um, if Hellenism, if true Hellenism resides, it rides... It resides in these fair shores. And that, mes enfants, is why Dan Andrews, the Premier of Victoria, did the lockdown. That was to protect the Greek community at large from contagion and so it can be preserved for posterity. Thank you, Dan, <laughs> for keeping us safe. <laughs> clearly, clearly you're in a mood to uh, be extremely facetious today. Can I get a straight answer? Is it relevant I'm, or not? I'm hurt. <laughs> You're not I'm, giving I'm me a straight answer. That the subtleties <laughs> of one's position can be dismissed with just one word, <laughs> which I can't even spell. <laughs> well, it depends on who's it relevant to and for what reasons. If you ask uh, Mitsu down the street, he probably hasn't heard of the Greek community. Mm. Um, for people that are interested in culture, for people that are interested in education, for people that enjoy the film festival. Mm. it's a very important organisation right. for people that are interested in advocacy and what we look like as a community to the uh, mainstream. It's an extremely important uh, organisation. Mm. And, uh, of course, uh, the annual Antipodes Festival, mm. which is uh, affords everyone, even the most disconnected, an opportunity to come down and get their Greek on and be part of something. So mm. I think it is relevant. Does it lose its relevance to people from time to time? Depends on what you're interested in. Depends on what the organisation reflects at different stages of its evolution. Right now, I think it's more representative and relevant than ever before. Mm. But we're also presiding over a community that's more diverse than it's ever been before. You've True. got people come recently. You've got people who don't identify as Greeks. Yeah. You've got people who are occasional Greeks mm. or performance-oriented Greeks, so they don't like to get their Greek on. They think they're Greek by going down to Oakley and buying a souvlaki, <laughs> or they. Uh, well, there's nothing wrong with that. No, some people, but you know, they ostensibly correct. live a normal, if you like, mainstream, uh, and we won't go into how we define that lifestyle. Yeah. But once in a while, they want to delve into their Greek culture, yeah. and that's okay. Kinotita hmm. covers all these aspects. For me, I send my kids to the Kinotita Greek school. Yes. Uh, my kids are getting their Greek education, their understanding of their identity, their identity formation, their, if you like, cultural experiences growing up in the Greek community mm. from the Greek community of Melbourne. So for me, it's an extremely important and vital organisation. Right. Ultimately, um, if you want the honest answer, mm. you, get, you get out of an organisation as much as you put in. And this one pays you back in spades. Really? I think so. Mm. That's not cash, by the way, guys. Um, <laughs> there is no let's cash. Cl- let's clarify that. Huh? <laughs> so uh, for someone like you, who's, uh, whose kids go to school and who's heavily uh, involved in the, um, in the Greek community in general, uh, you've, for you, uh, it's extremely relevant. And, it is, yeah. yeah. And I think that I agree with you. I think that it captures... Uh, of all the organisations, it's probably the one that actually uh, has cast the widest net. And it makes sense, Pete, because if you have a look, there are all of the regional organisations. That's right. Yeah. Makedonia, Thraki, Epirus, mm. the Pondians, the Cretans, the this and yeah, that. Yeah, that's right. And your involvement in that is limited to whether you come from that region. That's right. Uh, in the uh, This is a broad-based organisation which uh, embraces all Greeks, regardless mm. of region, political opinion, um, class. It, it transcends all of the distinctions that keep us apart. That's right. It's a unifying mm. centrifugal, if you like, force. Yeah. So what would you say then to um, its uh, effectiveness within, um, let's say, the mainstream? And I know we don't want to go into defining that, but do you believe that it does a pretty good job at representing our community uh, to mainstream Australia? See, it's a massive challenge because, again, going back to what we said before, what is our community? Mm. Uh, within a community, you, you meet one Greek, that's five different opinions right there. <laughs> it's true. So how do you purport to represent a community? It's hard. And also there's a lot of responsibility that goes into that. And you need people that have uh, some type of stature, mm. some type of professional uh, capabilities, mm. some type of charisma, the ability to network, and most importantly, with regard to the mainstream, the ability to be considered trustworthy and have gravitas. Mm. These are important things. 
and when dealing with the mainstream. Right. And the mainstream, of course, likes to pigeonhole you. They like to deal with certain uh, leaders of the community because mm-hmm. it's very difficult to mm. deal with everyone. And then if you um, deal with one person or two people within a uh, sphere of uh, political interest, it's a lot easier to get things done. Mm. I think the Kinoto does a great job. You see them lobbying on issues of uh, bilateral uh, trade agreements, yep. uh, medical care, True. Uh, the dual taxation issue... Mm. Education. Mm. There are so many issues on which, um, and this so never so much more than now, where basically the leadership of the Greek community can just pick up a phone, speak to a minister, get things done. Wow. Uh, we're no longer the. Hey, please, can you give me some money? Yeah. And I want to take a photo for the <laughs> newsletter. <laughs> that doesn't happen anymore. No. It's it's almost an equal partnership. Great. And it's a very influential one. Mm. Now, you can argue, well, okay, how does that represent the um, Joe Blow down the street who's disaffected, um, not connected? Mm. And the answer is, well, there are, as we said, a multitude of opinions, but there are five or six issues that we all believe the same thing in, which is the ones that I outlined, pensions, this, that, which are important. Mm. And that's where the advocacy is... uh, is directed. It's not directed towards party politics, and I don't think it should. The Greek community stands above yeah. party politics. Agreed. You can believe whatever you want. That's your business. That's they right. don't play that game. Mm. But where there are core things that unite all Greeks and are for the benefit of all Greeks, that's where they come in. And they also help the uh, the new arrivals. Um, it's amazing how many people call the Greek community of a week to ask for help wow. on a range of issues, welfare, social connection mm. uh, and these people really put the hard yards out there to keep people connected so i think they're doing a, a really great job mm. important election this uh, this time around aren't they all <laughs> i remember the uh, election of 2003 what a cliffhanger <laughs> i don't i don't remember that election at all it was grand <laughs> it was was it yeah oh gee it's been um I mean, uh, I've always known the Greek community having may, – maybe maybe it's because I define boards purely based on the president. Maybe it's just the way I identify the board. So we had – What does that say about you? Yeah, well – I think we can less, go back and refer to – The said about me, the, the no, better. No, 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 no. <laughs> Let me do the interviewing for a change. <laughs> Welcome to the show. So glad that you've joined us. Now – you mentioned before the fact that you're not that much into democracy, and now you're telling us that you define uh, boards by their fearless leaders. How so? Is this like the Führer principle? Been questioned by a lawyer here. Um, yeah, so you didn't really have to go that way, Pete. <laughs> I know I've usurped your position, but there are some there are some levels that even I will not stoop to. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Dean. Thank you. <laughs> But I admit it. The I've defined it as honestly the Funda era, era and the Papastidiadi era. So okay. that's, that's basically it. Um, uh, the Funda era was the one that I've always known as a kid growing up, yeah. up until you know, uh, up until two thousand and seven and eight, and then you know, Bill's era basically began. Uh, begun. Bill being Bill Papastidiadi, this the current incumbent. Correct. Yeah, that's right. So, um, so for me, uh, I've noticed a, a drastic change uh, when that happened. I'm not, I'm not just talking about uh, the new building that they bought and built uh, uh, or the reinvigoration of the um, Antipodes Festival. But uh, Well, no, let's talk about the building because the building, imagine, they erected this massive tower mm. in the middle of the city, sp- sp- there's this massive erection in the middle of the city and the GOCMV has done this. That's right. It's a landmark building. It is. It puts us on the map in a way that we've never been on the map before. Mm. That is a massive achievement. I don't think that we can truly understate its... uh, We can't praise it too highly. Mm. And the way that it was able at a time when people had sort of... We'll put it this way. um, Everyone was sort of disappearing and dissolving and the community was losing the ties it once had Mm. the erection of that building this massive erection was able to galvanize the people it was like a pole around which all of the uh, dynamics of the community coalesce everyone came together Mm. they came together 
Yes. Because of this erection. <laughs> <laughs> thank God for the erection. So, uh, building... No, thank Bill for the erection. <laughs> well, thank Bill for the erection. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. <laughs> so, yeah... Uh, so that actually, uh, I think that really attracted many other people to it the did, organi- it uh, did. organization. It, it, did. It, it, it felt as if the organization had a huge new impetus, uh, that it had uh, uh, new energy. Absolutely. Uh, new it thrusts its way into the future. <laughs> yeah, we're going to go, we've done these, par- these puns a fair bit, aren't we? We are. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, so, so, so that generated a fair bit of um, uh, interest and enthusiasm. Uh, but apart from that, you've mentioned things like the uh, the film festival. I think that can't also be un- uh, understated. Uh, every single community out there does have a decent festival. Our uh, our one is actually a pretty popular one. By it's comparison. extremely popular. Yeah. You know, opening well, night is packed, and the yeah. films are quality. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, but and then you mentioned uh, education, and I think we had a discussion about this. We did, um, we did beforehand, and the the level is actually at a, at a pretty good one, one that uh, you're quite happy with, and you're a pretty fussy guy, right? I'm not fussy at all. No, when it comes to anything except education, right? And let me tell you, the teachers in that school are brilliant. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. They are gifted individuals, mm. and being gifted, they also have immense support by the the board. Yeah, great. And and it shows. It shows in the delight that my kids have every Saturday when wow. they get up and they're dying to go to Greek school. Yeah. I hated Greek school. I know you did. <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, with all this, uh, with all this uh, that has basically been uh, achieved, do you believe... <sighs> well, they're running a day school as well, remember, Elfington Grammar. That's a day school. That's oh, a private yeah. school. Yeah. And they're running that. Mm. It's an amazing school. Mm. Um, the results, the community feel. Uh, mm. I went there in March of last year to an assembly and just the way that this is a this community works, this school community is just brilliant to mm. to experience. And wow. uh, it's it, it's just the hard work by the people that are involved. Do you believe that the Greek community feels the pulse of the wider Greek community here and acts on that? Or do you believe that it actually leads it and others follow? I think it's a mixture of both. Yeah. Obviously, um, you have a vision. And then the question is, can you bring other people with you to share that vision? Mm-hmm. Because if you can't, then that vision is going to fail. Mm. But if you can conceive of a vision and then you can bring people alongside to help you make that happen, mm. well, that's breathtaking. Yeah. Also, having the finger on the pulse, you must say, okay, people want this, it's a great idea, we'll do that. Mm. So it works in both ways. You can't have one without the other. Yeah. There has to be this constant interplay and interaction between the masses at large and the, the group that's governing the thing. Mm. And you mentioned uh, politics and how the board should be above all that do you believe that um the members of the board uh, are relatively uh, apolitical look everyone's got their own political beliefs and biases mm-hmm. but what you find is that um the board is comprised of a broad, broad spectrum of experiences and opinions mm-hmm. and you want that you want that healthiness that yeah, earthiness absolutely. in it you don't want people believing the same things saying the same things mouthing the same platitudes mm. you want them mouthing different platitudes <laughs> <laughs> Got to keep the variety of platitudes up there, don't variety you? Variety is the spice of life. <laughs> and what do you foresee happening this Saturday? Uh, I foresee that many people are going to descend uh, upon the uh, multi-purpose room there at the Alfington Grammar where the elections will be held, mm-hmm. and they will vote. That is what I foresee. How many members do they does the community basically have? Many, <laughs> we thousands. Don't. Yeah, thousands, thousands. Right. It is the largest organisation, member-based organisation, in uh, in Victoria. Wow. Greek one, yeah. Wow. It's the it's the key organisation, uh, and the elections are obviously very important because mm. the elections are all about emphasising um, mm. to the community at large that it's their uh, the, the Greek community of Melbourne is their community. Mm. Ultimately, the member is in the driver's seat. And they are the ones that can affect change, endorse current policy, mm. or drive drive the thing into the future. So yeah, interesting times. Would you uh, want to see? Or what is it that you basically would 
want to see going forward? Just much of the same, much more of the same. Do you want to see anything different? Do yeah, I do. I want to see a lot of differences. Right. Um, I go. believe that we need constitutional change. <laughs> the constitution of the uh, GOCMV was. Uh, I think set up in 1910. I mean, the organisation was founded in 1897. Oh, hang on, hang on. You're serious but about the, the constitutional but the constant, but, but the current constitution, I think, dates from 1910. Right. And there were a lot of reforms. For example, you have a president. Yeah. I don't see why that position should be called president. That should be what he's telling us. And he needs to wear, a, he needs to hold a glitter as his staff of power. And in his public uh, appearances, he needs to wear the fustanella. Because how do I distinguish him from the president of the Italians, the president of the local footy club? I want the man in the Fustanella. And I think that the candidate with the best legs should automatically win. <laughs> and you should be judged on those legs. <laughs> and not on policy. Policy is for poofs, Pete. <laughs> legs are forever. Oh, okay then. So constitutional change in the, um, um, in the thing. Anything else? Yeah. I don't believe in secret ballots. I don't believe in voting. What you want to do is you want to have people yawping barbarically at the names of each person as they're read out. <laughs> you know, who or who? And the one who's the loudest wins. Wow. Well, yeah. that, I would love, no, I probably would not love to see that to be absolutely. I loud. would also have it constitutionally enshrined that you don't have a sausage sizzle on the day of the elections. Oh, sausage sausage sizzles, sizzles yeah. are for Bunnings and for Australians. <laughs> it has to be a full year. Yeah. And it has to be enough for everyone to go around. Yeah. Yeah. And not the dry one, you know, the icky one. The one that certain restaurants have where you can't right. eat it because it's all gristle. You yeah. want the proper meat. I, I think that you should have the one that um the one that I used to have at soccer practice where you don't use the bitter bread, you just get a normal no, uh, see, roll. I find that abhorrent. That is <laughs> yeah. that is desolation. <laughs> the, that's the abomination of desolation as spoken of by Daniel the prophet unto the <laughs> Lord, and we shall not speak this ever again. This this is no good. Come on, it was like two dollars. Divest yourself of these illusions. <laughs> two dollars. You Nobody will feel better for be it. No, no, it has to be proper or properly done because we're a serious organisation. Right. Okay. Then. Yeah. So it has to be all authentic, right? Can't Absolutely be, yeah. authentic. You don't bastardise anything. Nothing. I mean, apart from the fact that we didn't have tomatoes in ancient Greece, doesn't matter. <laughs> That's right. We didn't. No, we didn't. No, they came to Europe in sixteen hundreds, right? We did have souvlis though. Did we had souvlis. We had souvlis, and yeah. there's a great picture, and I'm sure that you will find it later because I'll send it to you to put for the viewers visual stimulation. <laughs> um, the scara, the actual scara with wow. the, yeah, that they had when they were doing their barbies. Amazing. Yeah. All right. So okay. Well, we wish uh, wish all the candidates the best of luck. No, we don't. We only wish the candidates that we're going <laughs> to vote for the best of luck. Best of luck. The other ones need to go home <laughs> and reassess what they were doing with their oh, lives. Okay, all right, but we won't, we won't mention which candidates that, it, that they are. Oh, you can right? if you want to. Feel free. <laughs> it's a family show. I'm sure they're dying to hear your views admittedly, on the subject. Uh, listen, admittedly, I don't know all of them. I just don't know all you of them. You don't know all the candidates? No, I don't. You don't? I don't. I don't. Okay. I, might, I might know a handful very well. Because you know there's 19 that you have to vote for. I know. Yeah. There are 19 you have to vote for. So, get to know your candidates. <laughs> well, let me ask you this question because, I mean, this topic bores me to hell, but regardless of that, and I'm sure it's boring you people out there, but that's the whole idea. Put us on late at night when you can't sleep. Sure enough, five minutes in, you're gone. Pause us at that stage and then run us for the five minutes after that the next night. Improve your sleep, your, your performance, your mood will change, your heart rate will, be, will go back to normal, you'll have uh, less blood pressure. Really? We're doing this for you. Um, <laughs> you're telling me you don't know the candidates. When has this ever been an impediment for voting? When I go and vote in my council elections, do you reckon I, I know who those people are that I'm voting for? I have no idea. True. I see all these names of people who mm. I don't know. They don't represent me. They've mm. never asked me any questions about how I feel about the fact that my green bin has been out for collection for four days now, City of Mooney Valley, <laughs> and no one's come and pick it up, City of Mooney Valley. City of Mooney Valley. That's it, City of Mooney Valley. Cam Nation <laughs> may or may not be the councillor's name, <laughs> and you know you have to vote for them whether you know them or not. That's the brilliance about democracy. Mm. So what I usually do, Pete, yeah. and um, this is a secret, so don't tell anyone. <laughs> I do a little box. Yeah. I like the letter one, and I put Gough Whitlam because that's the only person I ever vote for. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> 
And or, you know what? All elections. I never ever see him at any of the inaugurations <laughs> or any of the. I don't know. I don't know what happens. Maybe they're not getting the emails. It's just uh, maybe he's maybe he's their own spirit being Absolutely because of your is. vote. Oh yeah, I think so. Carries that much weight. Well, we that wish. was sarcastic, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we wish you a Merry Christmas. On we go with the show. Yeah, okay, not a problem at all. So, What are we talking about now? Okay, let's get into some uh, some serious topics, right? Uh, the next one is, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the death of Christos uh, Satsitaki. Okay, that's a serious one. That like, yeah. just brings the level like, no. down, right? Because um, admittedly... Christos Satsitakis, yeah. president of Greece in the 80s. A okay. uh, famous man. The only president of Greece, I think, to have ever been depicted in a movie. Oh, he was depicted. But it was in depicted in a great movie, the movie Z. And you know, the movie Z with oh. uh, Gavras is the one where the great politician uh, Lambrakis and peace activist mm. was killed by the forces that ultimately then uh, caused the junta. And right. uh, basically, when he was killed by these, uh, see, I'm forgetting the uh, the English for it. Um, don't know if you'd call them paramilitary, paramilitary, parapolitical, parakratiki, we say in Greek, right. whatever that means in English, mm. um, connected to the state but running behind the state in the shadows. Um, basically, Papadopoulos and all the people that caused the dictatorship, they were the ones that organised for the uh, assassination of uh, Grigoris Lambrakis, the peak activist, wow. Thessaloniki. And my mum was there at that wow. time as a young girl. Yeah, She, she had been taken to go and see, see him and uh, listen to his speeches. And uh, Sarzetakis, as a young attorney, was the person that was uh, entrusted with uh, investigating what had happened. Really? And laying blame at the people who were responsible for this. So early on in his, uh, in his career, as a high and bright and very good lawyer, that's what he was doing. And he did manage to point the finger in the right direction, which is why, as a result, during the time of the junta, he was arrested and incarcerated for a little bit of time. Right, and he's also famous for another thing, Pete. He is the only Greek president to have visited Australia and had and have people of the community that identify themselves incorrectly as Macedonians, the the what we call Skopjani, right? Uh, throw tomatoes at him, and I think really? I could be wrong, but I remember it. I think it was in 1988 or thereabouts. Mm. He was here because uh, there was the Vergina exhibition. All of the uh, exhibits from the tomb of Philip in Vergina had been brought to Australia. Right. They were at the Victorian Museum. They were in Sydney. Uh, so many people going to see them, and mm. the local uh, Scopian community um, were very upset because uh, of these uh, artefacts' connection with Greece. Right, because their idea was no, they are Macedonian, mm. and that these things should have no connection with Greece, because mm. obviously they hadn't been to the site and they didn't understand archaeology, mm. and they, uh, you know, not being able to read the Greek inscriptions, which are everywhere, mm. including in their own country, mm. um, they had they harbour this uh, strange opinion that all these people uh, are kin to them. So Sardzatakis was visiting, and they threw tomatoes at him. And I've been looking for a photo of this. I remember the reports, and it was on the news at the time. I was a young boy, and I was just bemused that anyone would have the temerity to throw tomatoes at Greek presidents. <laughs> and you waste your time throwing tomatoes at Greek presidents because their power is limited. You should be throwing your tomatoes, saving them, and throwing them at Greek prime ministers. <laughs> the ones with the real power. Yeah, they're the ones <laughs> at the that you should be throwing ones. tomatoes at. But yeah, the only Greek president to have visited Australia and had tomatoes thrown at him by a very grateful Scopian community. How long was he president for? Eight years? Five years. Is you, that get, you get elected to that position for five-year terms. Oh, so all presidents only have a five-year yeah, term. Yeah, they have fixed five-year terms. Fixed five-year terms. Yeah. Okay. You uh, can get re-elected, like you can be reappointed in your position, Right. but it's a five-year term. Right. Yeah. Uh, how many have any done more than five years? Yeah, Costa Scaramanglis has. The old Costa Scaramanglis. Yeah, right. The great statesman he has. Yeah, yeah. he Okay. Well, um, so he he would he would have provo he would have uh, been president of Greece during the Basok era. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Right, and um, Greece went through a bit of a 
bit of a renaissance during that time. The, eco- the, eco- the economy went through a, you know, it was a pretty, pretty big boost well, in the Well, you know, Pasok campaign, as well. Pasok campaign on a uh, platform of alayi change, mm. and a lot of things changed. Mm. Now, society changed. Now you could say, well, were they the drivers of that change? Were they responding to the inevitable? Mm. How much in control of that change were they? Um that's that's a question for the academics and the sociologists. Right. But Greece did change. I mean, I, I come across uh, posters from the eighties where they're arguing about social equality, gender equality, these mm. kind of things. Did hand out very generous pensions and uh, cushy jobs to their supporters. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people remember that time as a golden era because they were being looked after. Yeah. Now, obviously, all these things come at a price, yeah. as we've come to know. Uh-huh. And you can't just dish out cushy jobs to people who are not qualified for them mm. or create jobs that don't exist and shouldn't exist mm. or double up on the bu- bureaucracy just so you can get votes. Mm. So there was a lot of that that was happening mm. and that stuffed a lot of things up. Um, is Greece better off socially because of the PASOK experiment? My argument would be socially probably. Mm-hmm. Economically, jury's out. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of this wastefulness, a lot of this... Uh, engorgement of the bureaucracy which took place is something that we're still dealing with today and trying, struggling to divest ourselves of. But you also have to remember that was going on way before Pasok. These were entrenched um, modes of be- political behaviour that Pasok may be magnified, exaggerated a bit, but they were doing it before. Yeah, we, must, uh, we must also but say... But whenever you sit around in Oakley, Pete, <laughs> and do this. Do this as an experiment. Sit around... Oakley, f- with some people who you believe just come off the boat from Greece or who came from Greece 40 years ago and seen the sipping their frappedes and wait for that expression. It's glorious. <laughs> yeah. what, what happens then? What is one to expect if one was to do this in Oakley? Whereas in Northcote, they say Ftein Nea Demokratia and they say it with a lilting voice. Ya ola Ftein Nea Demokratia, guy, man. Northcote Plaza, try that one as well. Or is that just me when I go? <laughs> Possibly. Be, Possibly. You must, your, your experience is definitely um, different to mine. But ha- you did it in a very interesting accent. We have to dis- discuss Seferli one day. That has to be a topic. That's not Seferli. I'm just saying. If and I resent, me, I resent the implication <laughs> that I am copying other people's accents. <laughs> I resent this. Might be my lack of repertoire in accents that it just reminds no, me. No, I of think him. it's absolutely true. But why should you speak the truth to power? It's wrong <laughs> on so many levels. It's just not done. All right. So, um, sad death. How old was he, Dean? Old. Okay. All right. I think right. he would have been in his eighties. Easily, right. yeah. I'm not. I'm not sure exactly how old he was, but old enough. Oh, well, I might and, uh, reading. Uh, he's yeah. He's a revered figure among the uh, jurisprudential sphere of Greece. Mm. Great, okay. great lawyer. Okay. Well, I'll do some reading um, on him because uh, people like that who have had such an effect on uh, Greek Absolutely. politics should be yeah. something that we played a uh, played an interesting yeah. role in Greek history. Um, something else has basically come up uh, and to do with the migration experience. Now, we've discussed this personally over coffee and like most things on this show, discussion on co- coffee over coffee tends to end up migrating itself onto oh, the show. Oh, I see what you've done there. <laughs> migration and immigration, mes enfants. So uh, what's happened here? What's happened here? Uh, we've been asked to, to provide some detail on Museum our... Museum Victoria. Yeah. Museum Victoria. The museum in Victoria. Yeah? It's, yeah. Um, has decided to do some type of exhibition and they want my migrant stories. <laughs> so this is what they've written. This is their little spiel. Yes, us. <laughs> we are hosting an exciting new international exhibition in early 2022... That's this year, by the way. And we'd like you to be a part of it. The exhibition explores ancient Greek journeys and cultural connections. As an introduction to the exhibition, we are seeking treasured photographs of Victoria's diverse Greek community. That would be us. Oh, yeah? Yes. We're looking for images that record modern journeys and celebrate Greek-Australian families and communities in Melbourne and Victoria from the early years right through to today. It might be a snapshot of a family business or a barbecue, a wedding or a graduation ceremony, a sporting or community event. 
or photos of arrivals in Australia. That's nice. Is it? First of all, <laughs> Yasas, <laughs> spelled with a double S. Why a double S A S? Keroto. Why can you not spell Yasas the way it's supposed to be spelled? Epsilon, Yota, Alpha. And it's two words, not one word. <laughs> it's like that Yasas dating app. Ask me how I know about the Yasas dating app, yeah, the happily I'll married man. <laughs> yeah, I'll ask. Because it popped up in my feed on Facebook. No, not Facebook, YouTube as an ad. I'm listening to really? you, uh, Yanis Pulopoulos, as a dynamy to pep myself up because I don't have any dynamy. I'm completely apodynamized. And this ad comes up about Yasas, Greek dating app. We will find the right person for you. <laughs> and I'm thinking, Kala, you, you are Greek manifestly and you can't write Yasas the right way. It's two words. Right. So. You know, like, what? Well, ya, ya is not two words. <laughs> that is one word. And ya, ya. Autonos in sto But Yasas is one word. So, okay. let's leave that to one side. Mm. So, we're hosting a new exciting exhibition mm -hmm. of ancient Greek journeys. Hang on, hang on. You're telling me you want modern p pictures. Mm -hmm. You want pictures of modern migration. What's that got to do with ancient Greece? Obviously, you have a stereotype in your head. And you're fixated upon that. Mm -hmm. And what do you want to do? You want to give us some cliches about how it's all the odyssey and it's not about the journey, it's the destination or the way around because I always get those two mixed up. <laughs> and we're going to talk about how important it is to be inclusive and um, how we all came here. And it was like an odyssey because, you know, Odysseus, he got on a boat. So obviously his experience is exactly the same as mine. Oh, 100%. 100%. So what are you trying to say? You're trying to say that like Odysseus... Um, we put out the eye of one-headed monsters. And I mean, why was Polyphemus the Cyclops a monster? I mean, that's terrible. That's not inclusive. <laughs> okay. I mean, the guy had a disability and you pulled his pu and you, and you, and you uh, poked his eye out with a spear. Oh, gee. Um, that's not my experience as a Greek growing up in this country. Uh. It's definitely not my parents' experience, although, you know, there was that time that my dad, and, you know... There must be an ism for managed, that. ...managed to... <laughs> Just dodge the souvla when it was getting prepared going in his eye, but that's a different story. Wow. Occupational hazard at Easter. Mm. Okay. Or the fact that he spent, you know, all this time at Ingirki while his wife was waiting patiently back home. And then after finishing with Girki, he ended up with uh, Calypso, who was going to create him into a god. Mm. Uh, um, all these things. Mm. That's not the migrant experience. We'll leave that to the side. But then again, this idea that, okay. We want to record your story. Thank mm. you very much. Very nice. Thank you for thinking of us. Um, we'll remember you next time we have a baklava day. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we want photos of barbecues and picnics and this and that. And it's quite prospective when you think of it. Like they're, they're very specific as to what they want. And you're thinking, okay, what do you want a photo of a barbecue for? Because what do you want to? Because what do you want to do? Basically, you want to say, "Oh, this is a migration experience. Look at us all being together. Look at us all having barbecues. Let's all having fun, being out and about." Thank you for introducing us to the concept of the barbecue, mm. because we didn't know what a barbecue was no. three thousand years ago when we were having mass public barbecues, uh, when we were sacrificing to the gods. Because you know how the sacrifices were. That's why Greeks never went into the ancient temple. What would happen is the altar would be outside. Yeah. They would get all the bulls. They would sacrifice them. Yeah. Okay. And there's that ancient story that when the, um, the, the gods, uh, they were first arguing who was going to get what, the gods and the people, mm. they put all the fat on top of the bones and the skin. The gods saw the fat and they said, we'll have that. And when they opened up the package, it was just bones. So the people get the meat. <laughs> so public barbecues is actually a Greek invention. And then the meat would be a portion to everyone. Okay. Like at a panigiri, mm. we still, still do the same thing now. So no, you did not invent the barbecue, we did. And barbecues and being out in the and having a good time is part of Greek culture that we brought with us here. Mm. And when we're going out having barbecues back in the day, all those mass picnics at Sorrento where you know you couldn't see any grass because everything was covered in foodstuffs and blankets and Greeks. Yeah, I remember that. To 3XY I remember those and all days. All these things, and yeah. before three XY and whatever, mm. with the little transistor radios. Yes. And yeah. We're remembering the Panigiria Stuchurio. Yeah. We're not sitting there saying how great it is to be Aussie. Yeah, true. We're remembering the Panigilia Stochurio, and well, we're not, but our parents and our grandparents are. Yeah, that's and, right. And you know, like mm. Lisaki in the corner and the trees, and you go back there and you think, oh, this is garbage and it's a pretty small area and it's not the way mum and dad or Yaya -ya described it, but it's, you know, nostalgia. Mm. So what they're doing is they're actually recreating what they've lost. So it is a discourse of loss. And that's not what's being addressed here. 
This is being done on a very superficial level. Also, there's no photos being taken of racism. There's no photos being taken of anguish. No photos taken of depression, of people working 24 hours a day just to make ends meet, of people not knowing what to do, of people like George Zangalis, uh, who had an ASIO file and was not allowed to become a uh, citizen of Australia because of his political uh, I had no idea. Beliefs, yes. Uh, there's no photos of uh, my uh, friend, uh, deceased friend Christos Muratidis, who had an industrial accident at work because he was ge- working under unsafe work practice like most of them did yeah. and paid for that with ill health throughout his life. Yeah. There's no photos of these things. What's a photo? You pose for a photo. Especially in the days before the mobile phone True. where you can do snaps all the time. You yeah. pose for a photo. So immediately, you are choosing what you're going to present to the outside. Correct. Now, what you choose to present to the outside and what actually you're experiencing, feeling, and your reality are two very different, distinct things. And it makes me think this, Pete. Who's in charge of telling our story? Because it seems to me that most of the time, when asked by the mainstream to tell our story, we play to their stereotypes. We tell them what we think uh, they want us. They want to hear from us, and that's wrong. It's misleading. It causes them to misjudge us. It causes them to misunderstand us. It causes them to misrepresent us. We need to be charged, as, as in terms of our community organisations and us as individuals, we need to be in charge of telling our story ourselves the way we want to. Mm. Bones and all. Uh, we need to be able to say, yeah, we went on barbecues, but this is the reason why. Mm. Um, yeah, here's a photo of me in my graduation in embarrassingly on top of your yaz fridge. Yeah. But this is why. It's because these people were deprived of education. They were not allowed to have education. They also came from a socioeconomic background where they were considered to be nothing. It was so stratified. And education was one way of... Uh, enfranchising you and getting you up there mm. and they made sure that we all got educated it's the sacrifice of people like my friend Paul who went to the same private school admittedly that I went to whose parents would basically not eat and deny themselves the pleasures of life in order to pay uh, my friend Paul and his brother school fees to get there so that he can get educated and it's the experience of Paul's dad driving him to the snotty little private school in his beaten up old Kingswood and the thing backfiring in front of the school and everyone laughing at him and him saying, I don't care. My parents have brought me here to study because I had nothing to do. These are the experiences. You know, there's the experience of Justice Guido of the Supreme Court of Appeal of Victoria who writes in his book, Call Me Emilius, about being ashamed to use his name, about being beaten up on his way to the train station in Broadmeadows because he was Greek. Unbelievable. These are the stories. And I'm not saying it that we should dwell on this or that we should, uh, if you like, wallow in this sense of victimhood. Far from it. But we should be able to tell the story as it is, warts and all. Mm. Yeah, we love being here. Um, just because we may, we talk about our experiences does not mean that you need to get defensive. Mm. Um, but it is part of the experience. Migration is not an easy thing. No. It's not we left the home country, we came here, and oh, how happy we are. Because you talk to the people that left, they're not happy. Really? Then? Migration is bittersweet. They're torn between a past that they can never return to mm. and a present that they created here. Mm. Yeah? Yeah. They can never go back. When they go back, the people they knew, the way things were is different. That only exists in their head. They were not able to recon. They tried to, but they couldn't reconstruct that here. But they've got the people that they love here. They've got the lives that they've made here. But they're constantly torn between the two. It is a hard experience. And that's why... We, we know this because that's instilled within our culture. I mean, Greeks, going back to the Odyssey cliche, mm-hmm. have been leaving Greece and establishing themselves elsewhere mm. since ancient times. True. You know, all the colonies True. along the Mediterranean and further and that's all that right, in yeah. Russia and whatever. Um, and all the Greek folk songs, when they refer to Xenitia, Xenitia pharmakomeni, me pharmakos eskaimeni. Mm. Okay? It's a bad thing. So that's, that ambivalence is what I worry an exhibition like this will not get if we aren't in charge of telling the story properly. And we can only do that if we, don't, we refrain from telling them what we think they want to hear and we actually speak openly and holistically about our experience. What should we do? 
well, with this if with you this have proposal. a fo- if you have a photo that you want to send there and I encourage people to send it with a spiel that puts it in context yeah do we know anybody as I would imagine I would imagine that there would be some committee or some person that will be selecting photos you know oh you can go to museum victoria and you can look these things up and there's a place where you can send and you can do things but I say add context mm. it's not just about migration being about us being out and about having barbies and having a good time yeah um there's always underlying things happening. Mm. So, yeah, that's my take on that one. But good look, good on them for trying. I mean, at least they're reaching out. They could have just gotten whatever and said, here it is, this is what they do. But they've actually given us the opportunity to contribute. So it's up to right. us to then say, well, hey, okay, I know, we know that you want to skew the narrative in a certain way, mm. but we want to shape the narrative by drawing your attention to A, B and C. Right. Okay. All right, so... Not saying we don't boycott or don't no, send no, anything no, no, in. No, absolutely no. no but, but the whole idea is it's again what you get out is what you'll put in. Right. That's my slogan for today. Every every show from now on is gonna have a running slogan within it, and that's today's slogan. <laughs> oh gee. Um I've got uh I've got uh, another topic over here I want to actually talk about and it's to do with uh an article that you've posted very recently on the Greek language. Okay. Was it a diatribe article? Could have been. It was to do predominantly with uh, the changing Greek language. I think you were referring to the language that was spoken in Italy. Yeah, uh, and, and still spoken. And, and still, sp- still spoken, yeah, in Italy. Yeah. And, uh, in and, and, and how the language itself is uh, protected by that generation and they don't necessarily like to talk to... Uh, you know their kids or their grandkids with using that language it's their language and not no the whole idea behind the article Pete was based on an experience I had over the summer I was in a park and I was talking to my kids in Greek and they were talking to each other in Greek because that's what we do that is how we roll and this lady comes up to me and starts speaking to me in perfect Greek right and her daughter spoke the most beautifully inflected Athenian Greek I've ever heard right and I thought okay these must be people that have just recently arrived but this lady speaks her greek is grammatically perfect but she's got a bit of an aussie accent right so i asked her about it. i said no your daughter speaks like she's just arrived from athens yesterday mm. but you've got a slight australian accent mm. she says how do you know so it's the way that you aspirate your s you know the mm. th- yeah girls that have been brought up in australia generally pronounce mm. the f like this that's mm. why when you want to do an effeminate male as a parody, mm. you'll emphasize that mm. because that's the feminine part of the speech. Right. The S. Mm. So all girls do that, and Greek Australian girls will that that pronunciation of the S will often carry on into the way they speak Greek. Mm. That's how you can tell. Interesting. And that was the only thing that made me think, okay, she's not from Greece. And she laughed, she thought that was funny, and it was true. Mm. And she said, What about you? When did you come to Australia? And I said, no, I've been born here. Mm. Now, the minute I said that, we went, this whole conversation was in Greek up until now, Pete. Yeah, right. And as soon as I said that, she immediately switched to English. I was telling her in Greek, no, you've been doing so well up until now, continue. She couldn't. Yeah. She would say a few words of Greek, then go back. And I thought, you know what? Sometimes it's not about how good you are in the language that determines whether you'll speak it or not. A lot of people say, look, I'm not comfortable speaking in Greek because I don't have the vocabulary, my grammar's no good, yeah. I feel self-conscious, mm. I don't have enough words to say what I want to say, yeah. it takes me too long, I get embarrassed, I don't want to make mistakes, I get all that. Mm. But in a situation like this where the lady's Greek is perfect and she switches to English just because she knows that I've also been born here, makes me think, well, that there are, there's, it's all about context and social conventions mm. that underline... Uh, the way you'll speak a language and when. Uh, and then that's why I'm referring to the Greek people because in some studies in some new books that have been written, right. um, uh, not many people speak that language anymore, the Greek of southern Italy. But even now where there are people who heard the language as children want to speak it to their elders, mm. they don't want it. They say, well, you're not part of that. You're not part of our experience. You're not part of ha- our mentality, the way it was when we all spoke Greek together. So don't worry about it. Mm. We're a bit different in that. With us, the Greek language here is, a, if you like, gerontolect. It's something that we generally speak to elder people. 
Right. When we speak Greek, mm. we, it feels weird to speak it amongst our generation. True, of it does. You'll mm. speak it to your mum, your dad, your your your, your papu, mm. but generally not to people older than you. I mean, the same age as you or younger than you. Correct. Similarly, um, I see, for example, uh, elder members of the community who whose English isn't that good, and they see my kids. How are you, boy? You alright? You want a lola? Oh, my kids, for my my son now, he doesn't speak English. Mm. He doesn't understand what they're talking about. And yeah. I say. They can't because it's the social dictates which tell them when and how you speak a language. Mm. And it evolves over time. Mm. So the majority of kids, emerging young kids, aren't that good at Greek. Mm-hmm. So in order to maintain the rapport, it is felt psychologically we'll speak to them in English. Right. That way at least they'll feel okay, they can communicate. Mm. So these are, the, these are the interesting things that I'm covering in the article and I'm comparing them with what happens in in southern Italy, where the similar sort of things happening, it's all context based, so that even when the ladies and the and the men who try and learn the language um, to speak to their elders do that, they laughed off. Ah, you don't know. <laughs> leave it. Leave it. That, that, that's our thing. You know what I mean? And of course, that has implications into whether a language su- uh, survives or not. Yes, that's very true. Because if very true. look at us now, both of Greek background, speaking to each other in English, mm. to a primarily English-speaking mm. uh, audience, such that it is the two people and the cat, <laughs> so we can have a quorum. Um, now, you—it's a social convention. Do you mm. know what I mean? Similarly, my mate, whose name I can't use because he said I can't use it on the show, who. Uh, Loves Greek, you don't know him, but aficionado of Greek, loves Greek language, uses it everywhere, mm. um, wants to marry a Greek woman, limits himself only to Greek women, because we need to preserve the unity of the race, one man once told me. It's very <laughs> important. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and that was even before DNA tests had been invented. We, right. we talked about that. Um, it says to me this. I go and talk to a Greek Australian girl, and the, min- the minute that I open up my mouth and speak in Greek, I get told, can you stop that? You sound yeah. like my dad or my grandfather. Right. Which is interesting. And my advice to him was, well, pretend you're on off the boat, Greek. Because authenticity yeah. and exoticism and right. the idea of, I, I am not from here, I am trying to learn English and uh, I am an authority on everything because I am from Greece, will work. And it does for him. Until she finds out about the two investment properties in Clayton. But by that stage, she's not really, she doesn't care about the fact that he's a phony. <laughs> so it's interesting. <laughs> Everything is context-driven. Now, crucially, when we discuss the Greek language and the fact that, for example, there were only 200 enrolments in VCE in Victoria for Greek last mm-hmm. year, 200. When I did it, it was about 13,000. Right. Now, and we talk about declining numbers and how do we make Greek popular, mm. offer incentives, it's the language of culture, it's the language of maths, and you know, there's so many Greek words in the English language. Yeah, you've heard that Greek about a thousand, thousand times, yeah. Yeah. Speak it because it'll make you feel good. Speak it because we'll give you a free set of steak knives. All right. <laughs> we'll throw in a Tsitsipas Giro Suvla as well. <laughs> um, no one ever studies the psychological concept. What makes, for example, two parents who are decently, can speak in Greek about mm. general topics, speak to their parents in Greek all the time, choose not to speak to their children in Greek. Because if you're not, speaking the language down the generation, it's not going to get passed on. Now, when that primary generation that brought the language over from Greece is gone, you're not going to speak the language to anyone else if you're doing that. You need to make the effort to do it. Why won't you do it? The Greek speakers, they offer some insight because in Apulia, in southern Italy, where these people are concentrated, Mm -hmm. there's two communities, one in Calabria, which is the big toe, Mm -hmm. and one in Apulia, which is the heel of Italy. Mm -hmm. Talk about the Apulian ones. They say, look, there's there's an regional dialect of Italian called Salantine Italian, which we all have to speak in mm. order to get it by in our society. There's the formal Italian which we need to learn for our education. Mm. To learn Greek on top of that is too much. Yes. What do we need it for? Yeah. It's also about use mm. yeah, and utility. Mm. Similarly here, do you really need Greek to get by in your daily life? No, you don't. No. Um, even Nels Cosmos has an English edition. Mm. Yeah. You don't need it. So does that mean that you discard it? And if you do, under what terms? It's all context-driven and it is all driven by psychology. Mm. That psychological aspect hasn't been studied on an academic level, and that's what I'm trying to stress in the article. If we are to take steps to preserve the Greek language, um, try and at least keep it around for longer, which I think most of us want to do, 
I mean, you agree that the Greek language is important. You want to keep it mm. in principle. Mm. In practice, what you do about it is each person's got their own ways of dealing with that. But in principle, everyone broadly agrees on this. Mm. So we need to study the psychology of how the language is being used. And that's not being done. Yeah, okay. Uh, from, from my perspective, I think that uh, a lot of it, a lot of the concern about speaking the language is primarily to do with the expression, being able to express yourself. So I personally find it extremely difficult. Uh, the brain power <laughs> required to convey what I want in Greek it feels like it requires 10 times more effort. That's because it's more important what you're saying in Greek than any other language. <laughs> is that why um, <laughs> The brain power is inherent within the paradigm of your identity. Of course you have that brain time, brain power because everything you'll say in, Greece will be, in Greek will be profound. Oh, of course, of course. But uh, it's just, it, it, it's, far more, it's far more taxing. Uh, it's far more open to misinterpretation too because you might use the wrong word here and there. We, we do that in English. Yet, uh, yet in Greek, it's, it, it would happen 10 times more. Even so, it's far more taxing speaking it. It then requires you to be, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't say guarded, but uh, more conscious of what you're saying. So not relaxed because you don't want to be misinterpreted. Uh, in the, and the other thing is that if you're not confident enough with the language, you don't want the person you're speaking to to think less of you. So there is a bit of and a status thing. And there's the other thing. point as well. For example, in, in most societies around the world, people are multilingual. Europe is a case in point. True. Um, no, my grandmother was illiterate. She spoke two languages in Athens. Really? Uh, Greek and Vlach. Okay. Yeah. Um, my father-in-law, who's uh, a Syrian, spoke four languages, didn't mm -hmm. go to school, because that was their reality. Anglo-Saxon countries don't promote language use and don't like multilingualism. Their culture is against it. Mm. And our inability to espouse our language and organically weave it within the mainstream is a result of that prejudice you think it's resolved oh, yeah. that no, prejudice absolutely because you see it you see it in the uh, right okay you see it in the anglo-saxon countries Never where people like that. have extreme difficulty learning different languages there's no coherent language policy it's not really they just pay lip service to it without investing funds into it or doing it properly we don't learn languages in Engl in the anglo countries very well or very effectively in europe you do um, my cousins uh, all studied English in, in Athens and they're all fluent in English. Wow. And my cousins say to me, well, you know what? We speak to our other Australian cousins here and we don't understand why they have difficulty in Greek when we don't live, you know, we, we don't have the benefit of a massive community the way you guys do. We learn English anyway. Why can't you learn Greek? And it's mm -hmm. got to do with the culture that we live in, what that culture makes us feel about our language. Mm-hmm how we internalise the stereotypes and the prejudices and also the social conventions that we create for ourselves as a result. Wow. Okay, so an uh, anthropological study into... Psychological study, the psychology of language. Sociological study too, maybe. You can have any logical <laughs> study you want, even a <laughs> geological one to see how the language gets fossilised in, uh, in community uh, discourse. <laughs> Just thought I'll throw a few ologies in there. I saw that. It For was, it like was quite in, subtle. In, in an it was quite subtle, but to I got it. <laughs> subtle, right? Yeah. In an homage to the Greek language. Why not? Speaking of prejudice, mm. uh, final topic for today. Uh, final topic. Final topic for today uh, is this concept of, um, uh, well, do you watch the tennis at all? No. No. I've never watched the tennis. Yeah, see, I'm I've watched the tennis. No, no, I tell you why. I was forced to watch the tennis as a child. Why? Oh. Father, sports mad. Cousin, we're very close to, sports mad. Right, yeah. Me, absolutely no yeah. interest at all. Why? Any form of repetitive activity, <laughs> and I repeat, any form of repetitive activity, I find boring. Careful. No, 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 this is true. <laughs> Careful. Any form of repetitive activity, I can't see the point of. Right. Okay, you, you grab the ball and you hit the ball and then the other person hits it back. To oh, you. Yeah. And sometimes you miss the ball. Oh, you have to watch the IT crowd, mate. I know, I know, I know you haven't, no, no, but no, you have to. we're not going to promote other people's shows on our show, Pete. <laughs> you have to this watch it, This isn't going to happen. Okay. And I don't get it. It's all right, I get you. You can hit that tennis racket really good. 
mm. uh, and you can throw it into the crowd and narrowly miss someone and give them the racket because That's you right. the ball. <laughs> and you can do all these things and you're a hero. Yeah. And I find our relationship with Greek tennis stars really interesting, Pete. Right. Because we never, ha- I never had any Greek tennis stars uh, growing up. I mean, the... The closest True. thing that, that I had was Pete Sampras, and Pete Sampras was from America. <laughs> yeah. He didn't speak Greek. <laughs> and someone told me that his mother was Jewish. <gasps> so not really Greek. <laughs> but also, <laughs> like one, one old man told me once, he said, but you can see how he got in there, not from being Greek. No. They put him in there. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's horrible. Oh, of course. Uh, stereotypes oh, yes. and biases that... Right. Some people have, but anyway, yeah. he was like the big thing when he I was, was growing yeah. up. Pete Sampras, yeah. golden boy. Yeah. Hellas fan club always going there with their flags. I don't know if Hellas fan club was around when Sampras was there. I think that the Hellas fan club came around when uh, Marcos Baglatis came along. Are you? And Marcos Baglatis was an interesting guy because he was from Cyprus, mm. yet his name denoted that he was from Baghdad. Mm. And he was... Uh, I, I first became aware of the Hellas fan club uh, through him mm. because he was the one that would come and he was very open, loved to embrace his fans and they'd mm. run for barbecues yeah. and uh, everyone loved him. Yeah. But the thing about Greek tennis players is this, works on different levels. All of a sudden we have Greek tennis players and then that makes us feel really good in our chests if they're big enough puff with pride. Oh, yes. And it's great because all of a sudden... Where everybody else is equal, because you really haven't made it as a people unless you fielded a tennis player in one of these operations, have you? Or sports. And you can create democracy. You oh can yeah. Found the Olympic Games. Yeah. You can create Siftetelli. You can give rise to Pandazi, but you haven't arrived as a civilization until you've won a Grand Slam. <laughs> okay. And you cannot feel good about yourself mm. unless one of your people has won a tennis match. Mm. So the fact that Vagladis was popular and played in the Australian Open makes mm. me f- validates me as a Greek. I can walk out there and hold my hand <laughs> out high and say, I know someone, well, I don't know him, I've never met him, who plays tennis and probably better than most of you. So therefore, <laughs> I trust him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love this, this, this need to validate who you are <laughs> through, through sport. Um, and now you have uh, our friend... Uh, Who's that? Tsitsipas? Yes, Tsitsipas. Tsitsipas is a really yeah. good guy, and Tsitsipas does things like, or he used to, I don't think he does it anymore, mm. quote ancient Greek, put ancient Greek quotes on his Twitter feed. Oh, right, I didn't uh, know he did that. And uh, ruminates over mm. the state of the world and philosophy until his mum says, go back and train. That's right. his mum's Russian. Why do you think he's got the discipline to actually train? <laughs> because his mother is Russian, <laughs> and they know how to train athletes in Russia. They yeah, do. They do. They They're do. good. Yeah. I think his dad manages him. His mother trains him. Yeah. And he's he's done excellent. And he's mm. a great guy. Mm. Um, very down to earth. And uh, we all love him and idolize him. Absolutely, yeah. He's our God. Mm-hmm. And like all gods, sometimes he answers our prayer, but sometimes he doesn't. Mm. Because the thing about Greek tennis players is this, Pete. They get our hopes up. Come on, Sampras. Come on, Tsitsipas. Right. Come on, Baghdatis. Come yeah. on, Koginakis. Come on, Kyrgios. And they never win. Oh. They never win. Come on, Dean Koginakis and uh, Kyrgios won the doubles. The doubles. <laughs> <laughs> the doubles. That's not tennis. <laughs> Come we, on. W- Even I, who know nothing about sport, know that the doubles count for nothing <laughs> when you're in the pub talking to, ch- talking to Brandon. All right? <laughs> yes. Come on. It's a very you a get very my hopes up. Aussie name you I'm chose. Like, Come on, because I don't know any Aussies. You know this. I live in an enclave. <laughs> you get our hopes up. You know we believe in you. We we, we want you to succeed. We yeah. want you to conquer Olympus, and then you bum out. Yeah. Every time, every time, every time, it's good. Why is it good, mes enfants? I'll tell you why it's good. Because it, that is the modern Greek paradigm in a nutshell. Near enough, good enough, getting there. And then it all falls to pieces. <laughs> that is Greece in a nutshell. Oh, every time, every time. Oh. The tennis player is a reflection of that. Mm. That's why I love them. Well, And then, I mean, you have... Uh, who's the one that... Uh, the, 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 there's one that's recently come from Epirus, so I support her to the hilt, even though I don't know her name. She's from Marta, I think, and that's part of Epirus. Sakaris? No, Sakari is uh, not from there. Sakari is dating the Greek Prime Minister's son. I thought she was dating Tsitsipas. No, 
Oh, no, she's I've dating the Greek wrong. Prime Minister's son. Yes. No, she's that's how, how these much things get done. Things. Yeah, that's, that's how these things get done uh, yeah. in Greece, as they should be, mm. um, because sport is important. I mean, sport is an international language. You don't need to speak to someone yeah. uh, in their language in order yeah. to communicate, establish a rapport with sport. Um, sport is the respectable face of our community to the mainstream, because when they see tennis players who can play tennis like white people, mm-hmm. they may think that we're white too. Wow, that's how acceptance. it works. Acceptance, acceptance. <laughs> Except we never win, <laughs> and this is the point. More people like Novak have to refuse to get the jab, <laughs> so that less people can participate. You know, Nadal's and you know, Nadal. I got the jab. <laughs> of course you did. Uh, okay, so that Tsitsipas can win. So Tsitsipas can be our god. Well, admi- admittedly, he's our god. Now he always <laughs> quotes um, the ancients, so I'm going to quote Hesiod. In relation to uh, Tsitsipas. Yeah. So words like Isotheos is equal to a god. Andithos is equivalent to a god. <laughs> Atalandos, not that he has no talent. In modern Greek, that's what it means. But in ancient Greek, he's equal in the balance. Atalandos. Yeah, so he's well balanced. Atalandos. Okay. Theoikelos, in God's likeness. And lastly, Theonos, as if. I don't know why I'm doing this. <laughs> as if, <laughs> as if. Wait for it. Are you ready? As if he were a god, because that's what our that's what our sports people are. We want to worship them. Mm. They can do things that we can't do that we can only wish yeah. that we could do. Like all these sad Greek dads in Brunswick yelling at their kids from the sidelines yeah. when they're playing soccer yeah. because they are sure yeah. that given enough dedication, yeah. Tristan. Papadopoulos <laughs> will play for Real Madrid. Not those, uh, not those, uh, you know, those camps that they do, uh, where you pay a lot of money and you go to the camp, and then they say, "Oh, if you pay this, maybe if he's got talent, we'll uh, yeah. he can play for Real Madrid." Like the real, the real Real. You know what I mean? Yeah, like that. We 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 idolize these people. We want our people to be superhuman. We want them to be gladiators. Mm. Uh, they we want to live vicariously through them. Was that what you wanted to talk about? No, uh, oh, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> what I w- what I wanted to talk about was uh, how uh, the, the controversy during the tennis, which of course you didn't know about because, no, because you because you don't, I don't, you, know you don't watch tennis. it, right? I, mean, uh, I know about their love lives, but I know absolutely <laughs> nothing about tennis. <laughs> well, like yourself, I'm not much of a sports person at all. Uh, I find that very hard to believe yeah. because, and don't get this the wrong way, you're possessed of a very sporting physique. <laughs> the, the, the gut gives it away, but, uh, but uh, we we lifted the table so no one can see. Our guts. Wasn't <laughs> yeah, that yeah, like no. a production decision? That the, the camera was also uh, lowered and yeah, positioned no, a no, certain no, way. Really true, <laughs> okay, okay. Don't worry, we, excellent, we excellent. do things. We do things the right way here. But um, it, it was it was to do with uh, it's specifically something that Kyrgios said, and he turned around and said Did that the after so anthropos. You know that Kyrgios also from Ipiros, just like me. No, I mom. had no idea. Uh, he's from Yanina. Th- does that mean that now you're special? Yes, because he's special. Yeah. So you, uh, as per and what you said, his you deserve doxa. All, all of his attributes mm. are truly the... He encompasses Ipiros to a T. Right. I see this in everything. That in does. everything. So you want to... True Ipiroti. Yeah, you want to list a few... Absolutely not. Continue. <laughs> My point is this: He turned. He, he was criticised. Him and Kokonakis were criticised a fair bit because they of their antics on court. They were pretty boisterous. They were pretty out there, loud, uh, you know, chest bumping and what have you. And had um, a crowd cheering them on, Hellas fan club or what have you, and very soccer ish in their uh, praise of the boys. And he turned around and said, "Listen, the sport pretty much has to change." Who and said this? Curious. Sport has to change. In the sense that more cheering, more this kind of thing. Less um, stiff upper lip type thing. and uh, Quiet, please. Correct. Sappers to serve. That's right. Yeah. Because there are, and uh, so I, I decided to do some research into this. Mm. Not too much because, you know, it's sport. But uh, some research uh, in, in, in what necessitates quiet on court. And would you believe, A, it's not a, a rule. In the um, in the in some sort of tennis and annals or. Κάτσε ρε μεγάλη δύο λεπτά σε αυτό το εξής. Ας το ματήσω εδώ. Εντάξει. Right. Who makes the rules? Yeah. What rules? Yeah. Do you know what I think of the rules? <laughs> well, that's where I want to go to, right? It's exactly where I want to go that's to because apparently it's all to, it's all steeped in tradition because tennis comes from uh, uh from. Uh, it comes from France. 
a niche, yeah. So he, historically, uh, 1400s, 1500s, it comes from France. It was popularized in the in England uh, or Britain uh, in yeah, the Henry 1800s. Played, uh, played tennis. Yeah. Popularized in the 1800s. I learned that on the Tudors. <laughs> That's right. We saw an episode. Yeah, yeah. Him and Henry Cavill, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, the, Earth, uh, the, the Earl of something or other. Yeah, yeah. give his proper title, but anyway. Uh, yeah, Earl of Sus- uh, Duke of Sussex. That's at the, the time. one. Yeah, Sussex. Interesting. <laughs> <Precious>. <laughs> But apparently it was considered to be an amateur sport up until the 1960s, yeah. which basically meant that – and what that meant wasn't that you weren't good. It just meant that you didn't need to earn any income because you were too rich to even want to ma- make which money Which was kind of it. like democracy in the 19th century in England. It wasn't a paid position when you were parliamentarian. You were considered to have had enough means to be able to support yourselves to sit in parliament wow. free. Absolutely. That's why they're all lords and members of the aristocracy. Right. So you're telling me that tennis is just like that? Tennis was like that, and, and apparently the crowds – that would watch uh, consider themselves of the same status, the same class. Therefore, you behaved as per that class. Okay. And that's where the history comes from, right? Excellent. So since then, it's become a professional sport, so mm. the things have changed, the crowds have changed, and now and now it's been democratized. Democratized is probably a wrong word to use, but it's been, you know, the, the masses now watch it as opposed yeah. to the, a select class of people. Okay. So it is, so the tradition of being quiet is actually steeped in class. Not in, uh, uh, not in uh, breaking someone's concentration or or or, or interrupting uh, a, a sportsman's ability to be able to, to uh, serve a shot. Uh, so what I then when I when I read uh, this uh, type of history because apparently there are different rules. Uh, crowd behavior rules for the davis cup as opposed to where it's more lenient as opposed to a grand slam okay even though the same sport is being played yeah <laughs> right so why is that and it's because this is a little more prestigious therefore you have to be on better behavior what about golf oh i i, I don't know i'm just talking about tennis because <laughs> you've got to be quiet for golf don't you otherwise they miss their swing and then they've got to see which way the wind is blowing well yeah, I can. I can. And you got to be quiet on the green. I can see that, but voice travels. I think that many people dismissed what Kyrgios said, saying, "Oh, he's another lout who's basically, you know." Well, you remember the Dawn, Dawn Fraser about five years screen. ago when he was having tantrums before he was yeah. rehabilitated. Said, "Go back to where you came from." Yeah, because you Especially know he was born here. He speaks no other language other than English. Yeah, but, you know, once a wog, always a wog. That's right. Um, and, but she can do that because she's a giant of the game. Mm. Not like Margaret Holmes of Court. We don't talk about her. <laughs> no one mentions Margaret Holmes of Court because no. she's evil and hateful, isn't she? <laughs> Dawn, Fra- Dawn, I was about to say Dawn French, who's an idol. Dawn <laughs> Fraser isn't. Dawn Fraser is not hateful at all. When she says things like, go back to your own country, well, um, that's actually just constructive criticism. Well, I was, I was surprised when um, um, Gulagon Corley, Yvonne Gulagon Corley, if she played her first uh, tennis match, I read in the 1960s, turns up in Sydney to play the match. Uh, and an older woman says, comes up to her and says, well, um, this should be interesting if I lose. It'll be the first time I've ever lose to N-word. You can say the word on the show <laughs> if it's for verisimilitude. Oh, you know? please, I'm not going to do that. But no, I, I understand what you're talking about. So there's the, there is the, the class, the gentleman sporting game. Okay, and, and there's Kyrgios who has no class. Apparently, mm. even though he's from Ipiros, and uh, saying no, the game's got to change because look, from one point of view, it's immensely boastful and prideful because this is kid you're saying. Do you know what? I've got my diehard fans. I can inspire passion in these people, in my tribe, in the way that none of you people can. Yes, that's yeah. right. Xeneroti. <laughs> <laughs> this is my tribe. This is my following. And they love me, and you guys will never get the love that I get from these people who I don't know, never met, and who I'll probably avoid at the end of the game. <laughs> Regardless, Kokinakis may be similar, but does the game have to change? I don't know. I don't care. If I want to go somewhere and I want to cheer someone, I will. It's it's to do with but you know what the, the um, influence, there are the always, arrogance of there saying are, he, there he, are he doesn't always, have a good opinion to, yeah, in order yeah. to do it. There are always a little restrictions about the way we manifest ourselves. Now, I'm sure that if it was Aussies yelling Aussie, 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 oi, 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 that's okay. Mm. And you remember that when Medvedev told off the crowd, Medvedev means the bear, right? Uh, by the way. Oh, really? Didn't yeah, know that. In Russian. When he uh, told off the crowd, because I know nothing about tennis, <laughs> when he told off the crowd for booing, you know, the majority of Australians and the pubs around the world and the journalists, 
took the crowd side mm. because our Aussies doing the booing. Mm. But when the Wogs cheer the walk, we can't have that. You can't bring the ethnic component into the sport. It ruins no. the integrity of the game. <laughs> yeah. Like the A-League. Yeah. The reason why we destroyed our ethnic local teams, and we don't want to mention the fact where they came from, mm. uh, is exactly that. Look mm. at South, the team that used to be called South Melbourne Hellas. Got rid of Hellas. Got rid of the Greek flag from their symbol. Mm. And they're this dehistoricized, mm. divested of their traditions soccer team mm. that is waiting in the lists to get into the A League and probably never will. Mm. Okay, because that's what they want. They don't. They cannot accept you, the mainstream, as who you are. They have. To, you have to remove the accoutrements of your culture and your identity before they'll let you play with them. Mm. The A League is the most, in my opinion, racist league as a result. When I say this to my friends who are diehard soccer fans, they don't give a rat's ass because all they want to do is cheer Mil Melbourne victory. Yes. And they don't understand what's actually happened mm. and the price that they've paid mm. in order to do that. And that is why I don't follow soccer anymore, even though I, I loved the game when I was a kid. Oh, really? Yeah. It was for that reason. Because, yes, um, you don't want to go down to the uh, old Heidelberg Oval and watch uh, uh, Alexandros uh, you know, play... Uh, the, that team from Preston <laughs> and everyone <laughs> engaging in fisticuffs even though they're, they're very I've got very fond childhood memories of that <laughs> but on the other hand you don't deny me the right to show who I am and to play sp my sport the way I am okay and if you're sitting there saying don't 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 talk your language what's the difference between don't talk your language on the street and don't cheer here because you're a wog because we don't we don't cheer in Australia there are only degrees of separation mm. and I say if people want to cheer let them cheer if people don't want to cheer, that's fine. I don't really care. But you don't deny me the right to express myself the mm. way I want to if it's appropriate. And you're not the arbiter of what's appropriate or not. Because that's what it is. Those boisterous wogs creating trouble. And that was what the problem was, what was with the Hellas fan club mm. back in the day. Well, I see more challenges coming up uh, in the short term at the very least. In the long term, now, we'll see if there's any... If Gilgis actually won, won, oh, yeah. you know... And yeah. got the cup and all these things that they get. Yeah. That'd be different. They would deny him nothing. Then he'd become the Australian. Correct. And then we could all cheer him. Correct. But he hasn't won because he is Greek. Yeah. Brings us up there and then leaves us hanging to dry. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking about uh, hanging to dry, we've come to the end. Okay, good, because I had a load of washing in the other room and I've got to go. You've got to go and do it? <laughs> yeah. Do you have any mandalakia, Pete? Because I didn't bring any from home. I'm afraid not. Just a box of tissues over there. Can't wash those. I think with that we'll leave you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again. Thank see, you. See you, Dave.